This is Karen with My I'm Possible Dream. And we've been taking sort of a little turn around the road lately, uh, not just talking about autism and not just talking about real happy subjects, but sometimes you can take a sad subject and turn it into something a little bit more pleasant. And I have Jennifer with me today and she's planning this run and uh, there are a lot of runs going on and I don't run too much but um, tell me what we're running for Jennifer. Yeah so the run we're scheduling right now is the Kira Kilbeam Foundation 5k and it's in at the towpath in Station Road Bridge. It's going to be on August the 8th uh, at 8 30 a.m. So, and it's going to benefit the Cure Kilbane Foundation, which means the money will go towards supporting childhood cancer research and also patients and their families that are currently in treatment. So, that's what it's for. So, tell us a little bit about this foundation, because obviously it's very close to your heart. Yes, it is. So, same last name, my daughter Kira. Um, she was actually born in December of 2010. She was actually born on Christmas Eve, which was a oh. surprise for us. She was due in January, so she was my present that year, which was a wonderful surprise. Um, so we started the foundation in her honor because she passed away last July, actually July 22nd, so it will be a year next week. Um, and we felt we wanted to do something bigger because we felt Kira had a mission in life, and I originally thought it was going to be to be the doctor to cure cancer, but I think God had some different plans. Sure. So what we've tried to do is take, you know, what she's inspired. She's had a lot of doctors who fell in love with her and just people we never knew who followed her story and felt, you know, really drawn to it. So we're trying to do what we can to use Kira and her story to help others. We don't want other families to have to go through this. We want to find cures for cancer and we, you know, want to help support families any way we can while they're going through this. So when she was born, she was... A normal feisty baby? So to start with, yes, and then she was between two and three months old we started noticing some things with her. Um, mostly that she just started cutting back eating a little bit. She was always small because um, she was born a little bit early so she's only like six pounds when she was born. So um, once we hit the end of March um, when she was three months old we finally got her into the doctor and said, you know, something's not right. It's not a cold, you know, she's not eating, she's pale, she's sleeping a lot, you know, something's not right. So they did a, a blood stick that day, thank goodness, and that showed her hemoglobin was really, really low. So they sent us to the hospital immediately to get some additional follow-up. So what did they find at that point? Yep. So we found out shortly after when I went to the hospital, I had no idea what we were going for. No idea. My husband wasn't with me. It was just me and Kira. We didn't know where we were going. Um, so we got there and they gave us the news that she had leukemia. And, you know, you always have the worst connotation oh. with that. You don't know what it means. You don't know, is she, she going to die today? Is she going to be fine? You have no idea. Right. So it's really scary. So we, we ended up deciding to go to Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital just because we'd heard a lot of good things about sure. them. And it was definitely the right decision for us. They took great care of us. And the director there actually met us. We came into the ER at like 11 p.m. And he was there to give me a hug and say, you know, we aim for a cure. We're going to do what we can for her. So we, we got going right away. So she was still an infant yep. at the time. And so... Um, and she, you said she died last year. Yes. Okay. So what was life like for you and Kira, your husband? Do you have any other children? Yeah, we have a son, Grady, so he's younger than Kira. Okay. So what was life like for you? I mean, here you are, a new mom, and facing all this. Yeah, it was, we had a different experience, especially with Kira, because she was our first, so with her treatment, it was a two-year protocol, so she started in, you know, beginning of April 2011, and didn't complete her last chemo dose till April of 2013, so two years, the first year was mostly inpatient, so we essentially lived in the hospital, they would get us, you know, a cot or a couch, and Brian and I would sleep there, and you know, that's where we raised her. She did all sure. her milestones in the hospital. We come home for, you know, a week or a couple of days and be back in. So 
it was, it was different, but it was our norm. You know, the hospital staff became our family. So they all watched Kira and they were all excited to watch her walk and, you know, just see her come into herself. And she was amazing. I mean, she did what kids would do. She played, right. you know, she'd learn how to color. She'd do music therapy and all that stuff. So you wouldn't, you know, if you looked at her and didn't know there was an IV attached to her, you wouldn't know there was something wrong with her. How did that affect, I mean, obviously, difficult for you I, I you know and I can't imagine I'm not going to put myself in your shoes but how did that affect you and your husband um, because that's not what you both bargained for obviously yeah I, th I think the thing is it actually made our marriage a lot stronger too because we you know had this thing we were trying to go through together I mean our family became a strong unit and the, the fortunate thing initially when she was going through treatment was we had no other children. So we were able to just like pick up and live in the hospital and all be together. And, you know, we were able to work remotely and things like that. So we could at least be together. But like you said, it's kind of a different norm. You're not sleeping in the same bed with your spouse. Right. And, right. you know, you don't get that separate time. But the nurses were nice too. They kicked us out a couple times and said, we'll watch Kira go get something to eat. So we had a lot of support there, which was great. And I like your comment, this was your norm. Mm -hmm. So you didn't look at it as being anything odd because this was your family and this is what you were going to do. Um, it's interesting because today a friend of mine wrote about the fact that um, he's he broke his, his foot not too long ago and then shortly after that, he broke another bone and, you know, he just feels like he's just never going to heal. He knows he's going to, but he just feels like he's never going to heal. And he says, I really shouldn't complain because it's bones and bones heal. He said, but I've been in and out of the hospital and I see all these other people who really have a reason to complain. He said, but this is my new norm. And I said, exactly. And when you use that, that had to have been difficult because you're pregnant and you're planning and you obviously had nursery all set up and now you're not even using any of that. Yeah, and that was the hard part. You'd come home and you'd see, you know, I just wanted her in her crib. Like, I remember looking and going, I want my baby in her crib. I want her home. And, you know, when she was home, I appreciated it so much. You know, I thank God every day when we were there and said, thank you for letting us be under a roof as a family. So it made you appreciate the little things people probably take for granted. Sure. So when she finished her two-year treatment, then what? Yep. So it was actually funny. A, a month before her last days of chemo is when her brother was born. So the, the timing was really nice. And, you know, and the nice thing was the last year of her treatment, it was, you know, outpatient. It was better. So she could be, you know, at home, be more normal. And, you know, you would think she was doing chemo. Then she had eight months off. So completely no chemo. We got to pull out her central line and she got all the chemo through. So she finally got to, you know, get in the tub and have a real, she couldn't take baths. I mean, we bathed oh. her like once a week because you had to package her up. So, she, you know, her stuff wouldn't get wet. Sure. And so she became afraid of the tub. She hated having her hair washed oh. and, you know, swimming. She couldn't go swimming. So she couldn't do things a lot of kids could do at that age. So we really took advantage once that went away to, you know, get her out in public, go to the zoo, do a lot of fun, you know, family things. Sure. So we got eight months of that. And then right before her third birthday is when we noticed things starting to change again. And then we found out in January that she had relapsed again. And this time it was different because the cancer had also returned in her central nervous system which they typically do tests for and they do these lumbar punctures to give them chemo and it wasn't there the first time around but this time it was and that is kind of a game changer that they really haven't found good treatment options for so unfortunately you know we kept battling through it and we're we're hoping we could get to the other side and she tried really really hard but i think it just was too hard and the medicines weren't what she needed and the medicines caused problems too so this was a question that I asked Tyler's mother the other day. Now, Tyler was older, yep. okay. 
Do you think she had a sense of what she was going through? She was awfully young, but... Yeah, so as a baby, no, because she didn't know. I mean, for her, like, getting her, you know, her line was they had to change that every week. You know, she'd just put her arm out and wait for somebody to do it. I mean, taking her blood pressure, into, like, that was her norm, right? Right. So she was used to things normal kids weren't. So, I mean, she wouldn't cry. When she was older, it was different. Like, when she was three going into it, she was very sick anyway, so she had some neurological issues. So, I mean, she wasn't Kira for a good month. And then she worked her way back to us. So I think, you know, giving her shots, we had to give her shots twice a day, every day. So, you know, that made her cry more because she had to get used to that again. And, you know, trying to get her to take medications. She had been used to doing those, but then we had gotten off those. And that's the one thing they can control. So they try and push back on taking those sometimes. So I think she was more aware, but... She was very accepting too. Like, I mean, we go home and then we come back to the hospital. She never cried. She never said go home. Like, she just adapt very easily, which we were very blessed because I know most kids aren't like right, that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And she made friends yes, at the did. hospital, um, and we happen to know that our buddy Quinn was one of those. Um, that's where you also made friends. Um, I remember. Um, when my son Alex was first diagnosed, well, not quite first diagnosed uh, on the autism spectrum, but a number of years later, um, I met another parent at the school, and um, sadly, her comment to me was, I really don't want to be friends, Karen, because if our sons both weren't on the spectrum, we probably wouldn't have chosen each other to be friends. And it has stuck with me, and yet I have met a number of families, yours, Tyler's, Quinn's, and you have created a bond, and it's not a bond that you would have chosen initially, but you realize that there, there is a bond, and there's an awareness that you have to bring to the rest of the community that even though you have had to nurture a sick child, you've had to nurture your family, you, you have to keep living. Correct. So how do you do that? Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of things. I mean, my biggest thing in the back of my mind is I'm like, when Kira came to the end, I'm like, I realized that I looked back at everything she went through, all the procedures she had just from January of that year. And I'm like, she decided she was done. She's like, it's enough. Like, you've done too much to me. And I think she wanted to free our family. I think she didn't want her brother to live under constraints because he couldn't go in public because he'd bring germs home. So I think she wanted to free him. She wanted to free us and let us all get out in the world. So that was kind of her saying, it's okay, like, go out, you know, I might not have been able to do it, but go do it for me. She wouldn't want us to be, you know, crying or in bed all day. She'd want us to take care of her brother and, you know, keep him happy and do what we can to help others, too, because that's what she would do. That has to be very reassuring, and I know it makes me feel better, and now I think I, I know her, um, and that's how I felt um, the other day about Tyler. I feel like I have these angels all around me and that's why I love what I do. So this run that you're going to have, um, is there a cost to it? How, how do, and if people can't come to the run, can they donate? What, what can we do to really support this? Yeah, and we definitely need help in any way people are willing to do. The cost of the 5K if you sign up um, before the event is going to be $20, and then if it's the day of, $25. And we also have an online registration and also paper available. You can access it either through our Facebook page, you can look us up, Kira Kildane Foundation, or you can also look at our website, which is www.kirakildanefoundation.org. So you can get access to the information either of those ways and be able to register. And you can, so if you can't attend and you want to donate, we also have a donate button on our website as well. And you can access it through Facebook. So That is terrific. And we're also going to put that uh, on our, on, it's on obviously on the podcast, but we're also going to put that on the blog, which is 
my I'm Possible Dream AH dot WordPress. So uh, you don't even have to be living in the Brexville, Cleveland area. You can be in Australia. Hey, Rich, if you're listening to this, you can donate too. Um, so wherever you live, worldwide, we we encourage you. Tell me about Kira's little brother. What's he like? Uh, he's wonderful too. His name's Grady. Um, he's a lot like her in some ways. I'll see certain things and I swear she like works through him sometimes or she's playing with him without me knowing it. But it's also different a lot of ways too because he's very, he's a boy and he's very hands-on. He likes his construction and cars and you know, hands-on stuff, whereas she liked her puzzles and drawing, and it's funny to see how different they are. And, you know, he'll trip and fall. He's very clumsy, and like you say, <laughs> a typical boy. He always has the skin knees and whatnot, but I mean, he's always smiling. He's happy, you know, gives us lots of love, and he'll recognize his sister, too. We'll see pictures of her, and we used to call her Kiki, so he'll look at it and go, Kiki, so. Oh, that's interesting, because that's my nickname, so <laughs> really? I'm going to, yes, so I'm going <laughs> to. I'm going to have to meet Grady. We're going to have to talk. <laughs> um, I find that interesting. Uh, and again, I found this when I was interviewing Tyler's mother, that she was talking about how she shares Tyler and his pictures and um, videos with his siblings. Uh, so you've integrated that into Grady's life as well. Yeah, and that's the hard part with it. He was so young. I mean, he was about 18 months old when she passed. So, I mean, they had time together. He might have some knowledge, but I'm sure as he gets older, he probably won't remember her. But, you know, we want him to know he has a sister, and, you know, there she is. And, you know, he'll know about her story. And she loved him really very, very much. And he loves videos and pictures of her. He's always asking for them. So. I think that's... I think that is really remarkable. Um, I know that my husband had an older brother who passed away before my husband was born, and very little was ever said about him. Um, there were pictures, and it was, yes, that was your brother Bob, and that was about it, until my husband became an adult, and then he felt like he had walked in his brother's shadow. Yeah. But I think this way, everybody has been integrated. And um, Grady will have an opportunity to know who his sister was and where she fit in. And I think that is um, wonderful. So my I'm Possible Dream talks about the fact that um, we dream about things as we're growing up. When you got married, you had a dream. Um, dreams don't always end up exactly the way we want them to, but um, sometimes we take a different path and we still can get to where we want to be. Talk to me about where you're going now. Great question. So I think our biggest thing is we just want to keep moving forward with our foundation and building more momentum. I mean, our, our goal is to become one of those big foundations that people know across the country. It's a very ambitious goal, but you figure a step at a time and, you know, we just want to do things to help keep people better and continue to give back. I mean, we were very fortunate when we were in the hospital to have people come and bring things. And we've been lucky to be able to give back already. We brought Thanksgiving dinner to the hospital. We did a New Year's Eve party for them. We've donated to some families financially to help them as they're dealing with this and doing parking passes. So we've been pretty ambitious within our first not even year yet. So we're really trying to make sure as people donate that we're getting that money back out as quickly as possible and using it the way we say we're going to. I just can't say enough about that. Um, you know, you you look at our society today and so many people appear, and I'm going to use that word, appear to be selfish. We don't know what other people are doing. And uh, I, I think that sometimes the things that we're getting in life are silent. Um, Sometimes we gotta, you know, pat ourselves out on the back and scream out, "This is what we're doing." 
Um, I love what your foundation is doing because there are people out there who need your help. Cancer is terrible. I don't care if it's for a young child, if it's for an adult. It's just horrible. And um, we've got to kill it before it kills us. Um, we don't have all the answers. And there are a lot of diseases out there we all know that we got to kill. But in the meantime, if we work together, we support each other, and we become aware, um, even if it's, like you said, bringing somebody a dinner, helping them with a parking pass, letting them know that you're supportive. Um, those are the important things. I don't run, so I probably won't mm -hmm. be at your run. But there are other things that my impossible dream can do for you. We can get the message out, and after the run, we can get the message out again as well. And if anybody else out there can support your run, we want them to either contact my impossible dream or contact you directly. Don't wait until it's too late. Um, Jennifer is sitting here and in some ways she's holding back tears but she's holding back a smile as well because she knows she's doing the right thing. This isn't the dream that she had. Um, I'm sure you saw yourself doing other things in life. So did I. I didn't expect to have a son on the spectrum that would still be 24 years old and living at home. He's a great kid, he can do a lot, but I still have to do a lot for him. But together we can bring out awareness, we can make life better for each other. Last words about your, your run. <laughs> Just continue to get the word out, anyone who can come. We wanna make it a nice successful event. It's gonna be a great location, we're gonna have a great time. Um, and again, all those proceeds will go to benefit our foundation and help you know, those who are in need with childhood cancer treatment. Well, a big shout out to uh, Rainbow and Babies Hospital, um, one of my favorite places as well. Um, although we got a lot of good medical facilities here in the Cleveland area. Um, a shout out to your husband too, because one of the things that you read about um, statistically is when there is an illness in the family, um, marriages tend to fragment. And the fact that you guys are still together, still together strong, and raising your son and getting this foundation off the ground, that speaks volume. So make sure he knows how proud we are of him as well as proud of you. So with that, my I'm Possible Dream is going to get this on the air very shortly, and we wish you all a great day, and get to the run on August 8th. Even if you don't run, get out there and donate. Thank you, everybody.